for tapes of end time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Now this is tape two of Friday evening, December the 28th, 1979. Bill Britton of Springfield, Missouri, speaking on the altar of incense. I said, praise the Lord. I'd be troubled if he did. Hallelujah. Now, you talk about the reality of demons. I know the reality of demons. I know, I know the reality. I know the need for casting them out. But it's not a game and it's not a spectator sport. All right? Hallelujah. There's a tremendous need for God's people, as has been demonstrated around here, to be cleansed, be delivered. Game to play or a spectator game to watch. It's warfare, friends. Hallelujah. So, the angel said to him, said, You send and get Peter, and he'll tell you the words of life. Wasn't the angel's business to preach to him, only to carry a message to him. So Cornelius sent after Peter. It took four days to go get Peter. And meanwhile, Peter was seeing this sheet lift, ray, uh, Lord, you know, with all these kind of animals and everything. That's not my point. My point is this. Four days later, Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, now, Cornelius had been praying at nine o'clock, or, or at the ninth hour of the day, when the angel comes, and guess what time Peter arrived at his house and began to minister to him? Would you believe it was a coincidence or an accident that he got there right at the ninth hour of the day? I'll read it to you. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm leading up to something, so just stay with me now, all right? And Peter wanted to know, why am I here? Why did you send for me? Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour, this hour, same time of day it is right now, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and a man stood by me in bright clothing and told me, send for you. Hallelujah. All right. Let me go to Mark chapter 1 before I go get off of this particular point here. Mark chapter 1. I want to look at what Jesus did in the evening and in the morning. And chapter, verse 32 says... And that evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. Now that was his activity in the evening, was a ministry of deliverance. That's the right-hand ministry. Okay? Now, hallelujah. I'm going to show you why the Benjamin Company is left-handed. I'm going to show you why that they've been set as a son of the right hand. And in the morning, verse 35 says, In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he prayed. Now, he wasn't delivering anybody in the morning. He wasn't uh, praying for, like, Peter went down to the house of Cornelius, and he prayed for, or he preached to them, and he brought them the ministry of salvation, he brought them the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, and the man at the gate was healed. All these things happened at the ninth hour. At the time of the morning sacrifice, they just praised God in tongues. Hallelujah. And they weren't doing any preaching. All right. Now he says in the evening, or in the morning, he rose up and went out to a solitary place. That means there wasn't nobody here but him and God. And he went out there and he, he fellowship with the Father. He worshipped and he praised the Father out there in the morning time. In the evening time, he ministered to the people. Praise the Lord. All right? Now I want to turn you to the book of Mark, chapter 15. We're getting a little closer now to the nitty-gritty. Verse 24. This is at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, whatever man should take. Verse 25 says... And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Right at the moment. I want to tell you, brother, they wasn't interrupting the ceremonies of the Jewish religion. 
The Jews didn't take a holiday that day. They went right on, and whoever the priest was supposed to be burning incense was right up there in the temple, and he was right up there at, at his altar, and he was burning this incense upon this altar at the third hour of the day as an offering of praise. But down there on Golgotha, when they were nailing the Son of God to a tree, there was a real incense odor coming up to God as a sweet fragrance before the Lord. The Son of God, a sweet-smelling sacrifice before the Lord. He was the fragrance of heaven coming back to the Father through the sacrifice and the giving of His own life. Hallelujah. Third hour of the day that they nailed Him to the tree. Okay? Now let's read a little further over here. Verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it, behold, said, Behold, he called Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will take him down. Now, this is at the ninth hour of the day. Again, the same day, the priest is going up for the second time and putting another handful of incense upon the altar as a ministry of, of uh, deliverance. And it was at that moment that he was crying out, and he says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Can you believe the shock that that priest got when he was dumping that handful of incense on? And the, the incense began to boil up in there, and all of a sudden, that old temple began to reel in the rock, and that veil was torn in two pieces from the top to the bottom and that poor priest there scared to death I'm, I'm sure that when that thing was rent and he got a glimpse in the holy holy he thought he was dead he might have died I don't know but he thought for sure I'm, I'm sure that he figured he was dead and maybe turned and run clear out of that temple because the veil of the temple was torn in two pieces from the top to the bottom at the ninth hour of the day at the moment that Jesus gave up the ghost now let me say something to you that third hour of the day is the morning sacrifice. That is the elder brother. That's the firstborn. He comes first. The ninth hour of the day, the evening sacrifice, speaks to us of the younger brother, the many-membered corporate son that comes at the closing of this day. Amen. At the beginning of this day, there was a morning sacrifice. At the beginning of this church hour, Jesus died on Calvary, and the Holy Ghost was poured out, that all happened within a few weeks, you see. And the Holy Ghost was poured out and the church was born. And it was from that time the church began to go through its agonizing suffering in this world. The body of Jesus Christ began to be persecuted. It says they beat them, they stoned them, they put them in jail. Saul of Tarsus went around putting people in jail and putting them to death and everything else. The body of Christ began to suffer at the third hour of the day. The body of Jesus Christ began to suffer on that cross there at that third hour of the day. When they nail his hand, his blood began to pour out. That was when that body, he'd already gone through beatings, but his blood began to pour out there at the third hour of the day. But at the ninth hour, he said he gave up the ghost. I want to tell you something. He didn't suffer anymore. When your spirit leaves your body, your body doesn't suffer anymore. You can beat it, you can kick it, you can drive another nail in it, you can hit it with another spear. It matters not. It's not suffering. You can hit a dead body, it doesn't hurt it. Amen. Because that body does not feel the suffering. Now, what am I saying? The sufferings of the body of Christ are about to end. They're going from the cross to the throne. The body of Jesus Christ that for the last 1,900 years and more has been suffering in this world. They've been fed the lines. They've been crucified. They've been beaten. They've been scourged. They've been mocked. They've been put down by the nations of the world. Persecuted in every conceivable way. And even today, they're scorned and sneered at. But at the ninth hour of the day, at the time of the younger son come forth, there is a change. And that body of Christ no longer suffers, brother. He went, as we know, into the tomb, hidden away for a moment, brought out and taken to the throne. And that's the picture for this many-membered corporate Son of God. The ninth hour of the day, the time of the evening sacrifice, the right-hand offering. Hallelujah. All right. 
Let me turn you to Manasseh and Ephraim. I want to read to you in Genesis, the last chapter. Close to the last chapter. Let me see if it's the last one. No, it's the 48th chapter I want to go to. Joseph, as we know, was a picture of the elder brother. But Joseph himself had two sons. Manasseh was the eldest. Ephraim was the youngest. And they were going to get the blessing. Not just the older son, but the younger son's going to get in on this too. You know, that wasn't normal. You see, because normally, why, each of the twelve sons got one-twelfth of the inheritance. But God chose off the Levi's tribe and Levitical order. They didn't get any inheritance. God said, I'll be their inheritance. They're going to be my priests. That left eleven inheritance tribes. But God made it the twelve by giving Joseph double. And he made both of his sons have a full share of the inheritance. So the younger son got a full share of the inheritance just like the older son. Joseph's younger and older sons. So we see that when Joseph brought the two boys up to his father to be blessed. Now these men were prophets back there. They were men that God uh, put the words in their mouth and he made the words to stand. And Jacob, as you read the story, began to give prophecies to these twelve sons. And he prophesied over them and gave them words that should happen in the last days. And there was a tremendous uh, ministry that these patriarchs had with their sons. Now, when Joseph brought his two sons up, he brought them up to present to the father. And he put the oldest boy in his left hand like this and the youngest in his right hand so that facing Jacob, when Jacob put out his right hand, it would be on the oldest one. When he put out his left hand, it would be on the youngest one. Now, this is very important. May not seem like much of anything to you. What's the difference? You get your hand on it. What I care? Somebody lays their hand on it, whether it's the left hand or right hand. There's no difference. All right, but to them it was a difference. Because the right hand was the hand of authority and the hand of power. The left hand was that hand of praise and, and so forth. It was a blessing too. But not the blessing that the right hand had, which was dominion and power. And so he was bringing the oldest one, which was entitled to it. No question about his birthright. He was entitled to the right hand blessings. So he brought him up and put him in front of Joseph, uh, Jacob's right hand. But when Jacob started to put his hand, he was blind, he couldn't see. So he's doing this by the Spirit. When he put his hand out, he crossed his hands. Oh, it's by the cross this happens, you know. And he put his right hand on the youngest one and his left on the eldest one. I want you to bear in mind now what we preached the other night about the eldest brother and the younger brother. And not say, well, you're trying to put yourself up. I didn't make this Bible up. I didn't write it. I didn't even translate it. It was there all the time. But he put the right hand out and he put it on the youngest one and the left hand on the oldest one. And, and he started to prophesy. All of a sudden, Joseph noticed what he's doing. He said, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Dad, you're doing it wrong. Here, come up. He picked his hands up, raised his head. No, no, this oldest over here. He thought his dad, you know, was trying to find the oldest one. And he said, I know, my son, I know. Let me read it to you. Oh, we read about where Benjamin would be a company of nations, didn't we? Amen. Look, kings would come out of his, Jacob's loins. And um, Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh, guiding his hands wittingly. And for Manasseh was the firstborn. He guided his hands wittingly. He was doing it by the Spirit. And he blessed Joseph and began to give him the blessing here. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head upon Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father. This is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And the father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Amen. So... We're talking about two brothers here. I'm talking to you about the elder brother, our Lord Jesus Christ, who had the right to the right-hand ministry. He had the right. He overcame. He prevailed. And he overcame. And he had the right to destroy the devil that had the power of death. He had the right to live here for a thousand years and disannul the curse that had been put upon man when he said, the day that you sin, you're going to die. And men live for many years. They come within 31 years of living a thousand, but nobody ever lived a full day. The same day they sinned, they died. Jesus came and there was no sin in him. And he could have lived a thousand years and disannulled death without sin. But he said, no, something's going to be changed. He said, God's got a different plan than this. 
He said, I'm going to lay my life. Nobody can take my life from me. No man takes my life. I lay my life down. He willingly did it for you and I. I want to tell you, brother, what he did for you. See? He laid that life down. He gave up that right-hand ministry. He gave up that right-hand birthright that you and I, the body of Jesus Christ, might have that. That younger son. And that younger son, by the way, has him as its head. So we're not leaving him out of anything, see? It's just that he's going to do it in a corporate body instead of an individual body. And so, with the Day of Atonement, the, day, the remarkable thing, the primary thing about the Day of Atonement in the Feast of Tabernacles is that on the Day of Atonement, all sin is removed. That does not happen in the Feast of Passover. Sin is covered. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you because the blood will cover your sin. But... It doesn't happen at the Feast of Pentecost because there was leaven even in the Feast of Pentecost. But he said on the Day of Atonement, I'll remove all sin. When you come behind that veil and put that blood on the mercy seat, all sin will be... And the day that all sin is removed, and when the day that the, the very man of sin is taken out of the temple of God, that day death is removed also. For without sin, there is no death. And then a people are going to walk on this earth beginning with that, the thousand-year day begins when that day of atonement removes all sin from a company of high priestly company that comes in behind that veil. When that first fruits company crosses through that veil and goes in there and sin is removed from them, that starts a thousand-year day. And they rule and reign for one thousand years until all enemies are under the feet of the body of Christ. And when all enemies have been put under... Death is the last enemy to be destroyed. And when that thousand-year day is over, death is destroyed. And there's no more death. Hallelujah. Because somebody lived a full day without sin. And that word is disannulled. Then sin is taken off all of the human race at the end of that day. Now, that straight a little bit to my story. My story was about this elder son, what he did. He had the right-hand ministry. But he said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Father. And because I go to the Father, younger brothers, my younger brother, the works that I've done, you're going to do it too. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Not because you're great, not because you deserve it, but because I go to the Father, because I'm laying my life down, because I'm giving up the right hand, I'm becoming the left-handed ministry of praise unto the Father. He said, I'm giving you the right-hand ministry. And that's why that all the world is groaning and crying for release from death and decay, waiting for the manifestation, the unveiling, the revealing of God's sons. Not waiting for an ecumenical council, not waiting for the world to get together with one church, not waiting even for Jesus to return and catch us all the way to heaven. That's not what the world's waiting for. The world, the Bible never says that the world's waiting for the rapture to deliver them from their decay. It's waiting for the manifestation of God's Son. Hallelujah. Why? Because this ministry of deliverance comes by the hand of this younger brother who's been given the right-hand ministry, the ministry of deliverance. But now, here's something else that go along. On Leviticus chapter 16. Hallelujah. I better read before that. I think I'll read in Hebrews chapter 9. Amen. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1 through four. Is there an Amplified Bible here? All right, would, you, would somebody bring me an Amplified? I, just want, I want to show you something that I hope that you're not just hung up on one translation, and that's all. Thank you. And that's all. I hope that you can understand that the more we know about the Word of God, the more of His truth will unfold to our hearts. Amen. All right. First of all, let me read in, in uh, King James, which is, by the way, my favorite. Uh, although there's some words there that that are explained better in um, other translations. Now, chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews, verse 1, And verily the first covenant also had ordinances of divine service and a worldly, that is, an earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein, that's in here, I don't know if I, was a candlestick? I, I, I showed that to you a while ago. The first area where the candlestick was, now notice, the candlestick, the table, and the showbread, which is called a sanctuary. I think I ought to shine that again up here. All right? Let me find it. Hallelujah. All right, he's saying here, there is 
first the tabernacle, and then this one out here. And he said there's a candlestick and the table here and the showbread. Now, that's all he mentions. Okay? Which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, that's up here. All right? He says, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid around about with gold, wherein was a golden pot that had man and Aaron's rod that butted in the tables of the covenant. But now I want you to notice something. It doesn't say anything about an altar of incense. What happened to the altar of incense? Well, I began to check on that. And I found out something here. Let me read it to you. These are the two most accurate translations. As for The Amplified I like because it, it gives you a lot of uh, magnification or amplification on some of the terms there. But these two translations are the most accurate that I've been able to, to find. And I've probably got 20 or 30 different translations. And some are very good and some of them are not so good. But to check out with the Greek and all, these are the most accurate and that's the New American Standard and the New International Version, which is the first one I found that had Holy Ghost fill men helping to translate it. And I want to read that portion to you in these two, because I read it. I went into a convention one time. Most of the guys have been going up to the pulpit preaching. Didn't even take a Bible with them. Just go up and just, you know, exhort and whatever, you know, just let it flow. I like to preach from the Bible, see. I like the Word. Well, they would just go up and, you know, just flow in the prophetic tones and all. And when I went up, I went up with nine Bibles and stacked them on the pulpit. Nine. Nine different translations. And I read out of all nine of those, one the King James and eight other translations, and all the eight confirmed what I'm about to read to you here. Now it says in chapter 9, it said, Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place. Oh, let me read verse 2. A tabernacle was set up in the first room with the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Nothing said about the altar of incense. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. And this ark contained the gold jar of man and so forth. All right? Let me read that now in, in this uh, New American Standard. In Hebrews chapter 9. Praise the Lord. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which was the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. And behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Now let me read this to you from the, from the Amplified here and give you a footnote that explains something here to us. Now this is important. I'm about to tell you something here in a minute. For a tabernacle was erected, a tent was erected in the outer division or compartment of which were the lampstand and the table with its loaves of the showbread set forth. This portion is called the holy place. But inside, beyond the second curtain or veil, there stood another tabernacle division known as the Holy of Holies. It had the golden altar of incense and the ark or the chest of the covenant. Now, a little note there by altar of incense, and it says down here at the bottom, not kept permanently in the Holy of Holies, but taken in on the Day of Atonement, as explained by the Mishnah, Alford's New Testament, uh, Greek, and cited by Wiest in Hebrews. And it gives three different authorities there for explaining that. In other words, I don't have this wrong. This altar was out here in the holy place every day in the year except the Day of Atonement. Hallelujah. Now, on the Day of Atonement, they moved it behind the curtain. And I'm about to show you another chart to show you something. But this... Altar of incense. Now, when, when it says here in the King James that they took a censer, there's the only other place that censer is mentioned in the New Testament is in the one I read to you from uh, Revelation 8 while ago. And the two Greek words are entirely different. The Greek word there in, in Revelation means a bowl in which they put fire where they poured the incense in. And they set that bowl on top of the altar of incense. The altar of incense was not all where they had to scoop the ashes out with a fire and all. It was just a table that they set the golden bowl of ins uh, the censer upon. It was what carried the fire. That's what they put the incense in. The altar itself was just a table. didn't have pans and shovels and ashes and stuff like that in that. Now, they didn't take that censer into the Holy of Holies and set it on the ground. And they didn't set it upon the mercy seat. That's why they took the altar of incense in. And that represents the church of Jesus Christ and its twofold ministry of praise and, uh, and deliverance. All right. Now, 
On the Day of Atonement, here's what happened. Sixteenth chapter of the book of Leviticus. Hallelujah. In the sixteenth chapter of the book of Leviticus, verse 12. Hallelujah. Uh, let me read verse 11 and 12. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering. Now, this whole chapter is concerning the Day of Atonement. And the, Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself, and make an atonement for him, um, for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full, hands plural, and all these other translations say both hands are two hands. So this day he took both hands of incense, only day in the year, where they offered up both hands of incense. The other times they'd have one in the morning, one in the evening. Not on this day. They just went in one time on this day of atonement. All right? And it says, His hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Hallelujah. And that's where they put it upon the altar, that the cloud would cover the mercy seat, that he die not. Okay. Now, what is happening here is that on the day of atonement, several things took place. Praise the Lord. Let me just start here. First of all, the first thing that happened was all the sanctuary priests had to leave the holy place. They had to go to the outer court. If they were not going behind the veil, they had to go back to the outer court. Here's where it says. Verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he comes out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household for all the congregation of Israel. So the first thing that happened was that all the priests that normally ministered in the holy place, in the sanctuary, before the table of showbread, the candlestick and all that, those on the Day of Atonement, they did not go in there. They were sent to the outer court. If they weren't going behind the veil, they had to go back. Are you aware that those are not going on, those in Pentecost I'm talking about, the tongue talkers, the charismatics, those that are not going on with God, are getting back into the outer court religion and are becoming like the things they come out of. That's what's happening to them. Nobody's allowed to stay in that holy place, in that supernatural. And here's what you're going to find. The closer we get to the hour when the sons of God go behind the veil, those that are not pressing on into that place, you're going to find less and less of the supernatural happening in their ministry. Hallelujah. All right? So the first thing that happened is that the sanctuary priest had to leave the outer court. See, this was not just a 15-minute job. There was a lot of things that took place during this day. A lot of people just expect everything to be over in just a couple of minutes. The next thing is they had to, the high priest had to take this incense altar and take it behind the veil. It had to be there when he came in with a fire, with the, bowl, with the incense and the censer. Now, so he went, makes a trip behind the veil. Then he comes back out. Oh, praise God. You know, old Paul got back there behind the veil one time. He saw a few things and heard a few things. He called it the third heaven, that third dimension, behind that third curtain. All right. So they take the incense altar back behind the veil. That's the only day in the year that it goes back there. Next thing he does, he brings in the golden censer, and it's full of fire. Now, you see, he can't do all this at once. He's not going to put that altar under one arm, a bowl of incense, under the other arm, I mean a bowl of fire under the other arm and both hands full of incense. He's got to make several trips. So the next thing he does, he goes in there and he takes the fire and he puts it on the altar. And the next thing he does, he takes both hands full of incense. Now, as I said, one of those hands represents the third hour of the day morning, the morning sacrifice, third hour of the day incense. The other one represents that evening sacrifice. One of them represented the morning sun. One of them represent the evening corporate sun. But on the Day of Atonement, they get together. And they're poured together into that behind the veil. And there's going to be a ministry, brother. And when you pour that incense in there, when you dump both hands full of incense in there, you can't tell what part of that cloud is coming from the left-hand ministry and what's coming from the right-hand ministry. You hear what I'm saying? In that hour that we go through that veil into the likeness of Jesus Christ, brother, they're not going to be able to tell the difference. They're not going to say, well, it was nice to have you here, but we'd rather have Jesus. Because that ministry that comes up is going to be so much, it's all going to be one ministry flowing out of one cloud of incense flowing up, you see, out of both hands of incense. And I want to tell you that all of the deliverance 
all of our ministry, all of our praises are going to go behind the veil. You're going to notice in revival, and especially I've noticed in this revival, as God quickened our hearts, began to pour out His Spirit and began to draw us closer to the veil, our praises began to reach a higher chord. Our ministry began to reach a, a stronger, deeper uh, power and force against Satan's kingdom. And as you go behind that veil, that's the place Jesus ministered out of. See, because the Bible says in Hebrews 10 that that veil was his flesh. One part of him faced the Father, and he saw what the Father did. He, he could see what was happening in the heavenlies. He said no, no devil could hide from him. The heavens were open to him. When he come up out of the water, he said the heavens were open. And so he was... He could go into a church and every demon in that church was wide open. You know, I walk into a church and I feel kind of strange, but where's it coming from? I don't know. There's so many spirits around and I can't tell. Once in a while, God gives me a glimpse. God gives me a little discernment. But most of the time, I don't know. Not him, brother. The heavens were open to him. He walked in and the devil started crying out, Oh, what are you coming here to torment me for? Right into a synagogue. A man had been there maybe causing trouble for 15 years. As soon as Jesus walked in, he was exposed. Why? Because, you see, that was open to him. That heaven was open. But he ministered out of that realm. He said he didn't need anybody to tell him what was in man. He knew what was in man. Hallelujah. And he ministered from that order. But that's the area he's bringing us to. Somebody said, oh, we're going to get through all this religious stuff. Listen, all this religious stuff, praying, preaching, delivering people, raising the dead, that's just going to begin when they get behind the veil. It's just going to get into another order. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 6 says... And there's a message in that pink book about this. But there's Hebrews chapter 6 says that all this power we have, all this Holy Ghost that we got, and all these miracles we got are just a taste of the miracles that belong to another age. They are the, we have tasted of the miracle working powers of an age to come. These miracles we see, the power we have over the devil, that all belongs to another age. The Bible says this age of darkness, he's the God of this age. But because we have the power of Jesus Christ in us, He that's within us is greater than He that's out there in the world. So that even now, though we're dwelling in this age, in His age of darkness, we have power over Him. But what we have is just a taste of the power, the miracle working power of another age. When we go through that veil, when that, those two hands of incense, that younger brother and older brother, are joined together in their ministry behind the veil, you're going to see an age, brother, when miracles are going to be the order of the day. Amen. Hallelujah. What a joy it will be to minister. Amen. Old Gideon up there. Bless God. You know where this 300 men? Oh, I could preach all night, brother. I didn't think I could, but I could now. Hallelujah. I relate to Paul the Apostle that preached till midnight and somebody fell out. You know why he fell out the window and broke his neck? Huh? He's leaning the wrong way. You better lean the right way when you hear the word. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, and then he said after he went down and raised him from the dead and brought his life back into him, he said he kept on preaching until daybreak. I can relate to that because, boy, when this thing flows, you know, all you need is just God give you strength, that's all. Now, I'll get weak after it's over, but I've got strength now. But let me just say this. Gideon was out there with his 300 and he told him, he said, all right, now you 100, you go over this mountain. You 100, you go there, and I'm going to be with this 100 right here. Okay? So there's 300. Now, 300 is the number of divine deliverance. Noah's Ark, 300 cubits long. 300 cubits of material in those three curtains, 10 by 10, 5 by 20, 300 around, right, around the tabernacle, 300 cubits. See, it's a, it's a means of divine deliverance. So, uh, he had his 300 men, but he had to stay with one of those groups. And he said to the others, don't start your ministry. Don't break your vessels. Don't toot your horns. Don't blow your trumpets until you hear us blow our trumpets. And when you hear us blow our trumpets, that's a signal for you, brother. When you hear the sons of God begin to blow this end time message, this uh, everlasting gospel, this last trumpet begins to blow, you're going to see the greatest salvation revival over on this hill you ever saw. You're going to see the greatest healing revivals and miracles and people getting the Holy Ghost over here you ever saw. And those that are ministering in that level, and there'll be plenty in that realm, when they're, they're going to find, brother, the greatest revival the greatest joy hey, any man that's ever been out there and tried to win souls and, and just seen maybe one out of a hundred get saved or, or one out of twenty get healed frustrating what a joy it is to see this thing work 
from behind the veil, where there are no mistakes, where there are no failures. Hallelujah. And he said, now wait. He said, don't you move till the one, the company I'm with blows. Now Jesus is with one of those companies. Which company do you think he's in? He in the salvation group? He just gone the 34 way? Maybe he was in the 64 company over there? No, no. But Jesus was behind the veil. He's a son. He's of that sonship company. And when he and his sonship company begin to blow the trumpets, you're going to find revival starting in every area of the ministry. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know how I'll get off on Gideon. Where am I? Hallelujah. Both hands full of incense put on the altar. And then the blood of the bullock was put on the mercy seat to cleanse the priesthood. See, because that priesthood have, had to have all their cleansing done. Amen. Before that, the second one, that's the blood of the ram, was put on the mercy seat. And that's where the scapegoat was loose into the wilderness. And the blood of this other goat, which they laid their hands on and slew it, that's what ram was a full-grown he-goat. And they brought that blood, and that was for the sins of the people. See, first of all, you've got to have a ministry. Now, in the Feast of Passover, the responsibility was upon each individual. The law went forth and said, Now, every one of you take a lamb, and you slay that lamb, and you take that blood, and you sprinkle over your own door, and you eat that lamb with your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hands, and don't leave any of it till morning. It'll have to be burned by fire. You don't get all of Jesus in you, brother. You don't get all his nature, you're going to have to go through a fire, I tell you that. But anyhow, he said, that's your responsibility. No priest is going to come around and sprinkle that blood over your own doorpost. You've got to do it yourself. Let me tell you something. The Passover, salvation, if you're saved and you go to heaven, it's because you've got a responsibility to, to deal with that thing yourself. You have to accept Jesus. No preacher can do it for you. You're not saved because you belong to somebody, some preacher's family, your preacher's son, or because you went to a church that believed salvation for X number of years, not because they took you when you was an infant and didn't know any better and baptized you and sprinkled some water on you and said, we put you in the body of Christ. That is not what gets you to heaven. Nobody else can do this for you. You have to take that blood and put it on your house. That's your responsibility. Now, that's Passover. That's a covering for sin. But when it comes to the Feast of Tabernacles, when all sin is removed, that's another thing that is done by a ministry. The individual, they didn't line up all two million Jews out there at the door of the tabernacle and each one of them take some blood in and put it on that mercy seat. They didn't do that. One priest went behind that veil for all of them. And he put that blood on the mercy seat. And I want to tell you, there's a high priest of the company. Jesus went up in that heavenly sanctuary and he did this for us. But here, for the redemption of this body, for us to be fulfilled on this earth, there is a high priest of the company that's going to go through that veil and they're going back there and put the blood, first of all, for their own sins. That's the blood of the bullet. This all found in the 16th chapter of Leviticus. And they took the blood of the bullet and they put that, and that was to cleanse Aaron and his sons. Amen. So that the priesthood would be clean. Because until the priesthood has come into this ministry, they cannot minister this life to the rest of the world. There's got to be a high priest of the company to come into full sonship. They come into the fullness of God, come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And when that happens, brother, that company is going to blow a jubilee trumpet, and they're going to sound this message, and everywhere that trumpet is heard, people are going to be set free. Amen. They're going to minister the blood of the ram to the world. First comes the blood of the bullet. Then comes the blood of the ram. Amen. For the sins of the people. And then lastly comes the jubilee trumpet. It says, on the tenth day of the seventh month, right the same day that this is all happening, they start blowing the jubilee trumpet, and all creation is set free. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, one thing here I want to confirm. Something Brother Ellenwood was talking about this morning, and that's on the headship company. He was talking about that headship company flowing through those two olive trees there, down into the church, the body of the body. All right? Now... The Lord showed me this little diagram one time, and it relates to chapter 11 and verse 3. Let me just read it for you in 1 Corinthians. Hallelujah. Chapter 11 and verse 3. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Now, I'm not talking about natural. I'm not talking about your home life and all that. Your pastor can deal with those things. I'm talking about the revelation of the body of Jesus Christ. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, in God's plan and purpose, we have 
three heads and three bodies, which in the final analysis makes up one glorious body that God may be all and in all. Hallelujah. First of all, he said God is the head of Jesus Christ. Now, the Bible tells us that. I don't have to quote all the scriptures to you. It said that he was the, he was the, uh, the image of the invisible God. And he continually said, I don't do anything but what the Father tells me. God was his head in that he directed every step of Jesus took. He was his head. Not a, I'm not talking about a physical head. I'm talking about the direction of his life, the force in his life. His headship over his life was the Father. All right? So that the man Jesus Christ, God, deity is his head. So we have one God, the head and the body. One God, one Lord. All right. No question there. I don't know. Folks ask me about oneness, and, and I, I don't have two gods or three gods. There's only one God. But I recognize that Jesus is the body, the visible uh, representation. He is the uh, visible glory of that invisible, omnipresent God. Okay. Now we have, he said, Jesus is the head of the man, or the man-child, the sons of God company. And there is one body, one Son, one Christ. We dealt with this the other night, where that our Lord in His Christ. Okay? But Jesus is the head, the living force, the direction for His people, His body, His man-child. And so there is one Son of God, but He's a corporate Son. He's that one we're talking about that's coming forth of the right-hand ministry. But friends, it's Jesus Himself is a part of that company, too. He's made himself the head of that company, or God gave him to be the head over that company. All right? Then we find there's one church, and that church has a head and a uh, body. And he said the man is the head of the woman. All right, there's a lot more to be said on that, except to say that when you get through, there's no place to divide this. Because if you try to divide the church off from God, you divide right between Jesus and the man child. If you try to divide the church off from the head, there's no way. You can't divide the church, you can't divide the Son, and you can't divide God. So when you end up, God is the head of this whole thing. This is the body of Jesus Christ, of which God Himself is the head through all of eternity. Hallelujah. Now, I said all that to tell you this. I don't believe it, but it's so. Hallelujah. Yeah, there's a lot of warfare going on. A lot of frustrations, a lot of disappointments, a lot of battles and a lot of wounds. A lot of hurts and sicknesses and all that. But the goal is there. And God's purpose is that you, his body, his younger brother, is going to sit and rule and reign with him for a thousand years upon this earth and bring creation back in the divine order. And this is going to be according to all the scriptures that he's given us of the incense. That's just one picture. But the two hands of incense. The morning sacrifice, which was Jesus. The time his body began to suffer. The evening sacrifice, when his body ends its suffering, and he ascends to the throne. Hallelujah. What a picture of the body of Jesus Christ. When that veil of the temple was rent. And what he says rent for? Hebrews chapter 10 says, Having therefore boldness, brethren, to come to enter the Holy of Holies by the blood of Jesus, by an anew and a living way, which is consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So that veil was rent, and it was rent not at the third hour when they nailed his hands to the tree, but at the ninth hour when the sufferings ended for the body of Christ. That's when the veil was rent, and that made us access for us to come into the Holy of Holies. We are not stopping at Pentecost. We're not stopping with a supernatural, charismatic, tongue-talking, prophesying, demon-casting out uh, ministry. We're going through the veil into the very fullness of God. Hallelujah. Would you lift your hands and praise God with us? Glory to God. Lord Jesus, you are he that sits upon the throne. Oh, blessed be your name. Hallelujah. 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 I don't apologize for the word. I just apologize it takes me so long to get it. Because I know it's been a long day. And I'm going to turn you loose now. We're going to dismiss you. But those of you that need help, if you need special prayer, whether it's to be saved, to be filled with the Spirit, 
to be healed or to have a spiritual healing, you come and we'll pray for you as we dismiss the rest of the folks. Hallelujah. And don't worry about them. I mean, we're going to dismiss. I can work just as good, praise God, as other folks are talking and going about leaving and all that. doesn't bother. Because God's one does work anyhow. Hallelujah. But we're going, to, we're going to turn you loose now. But remember, come back tomorrow. There's going to be great things happening in here. I give honor to God and praise to God for the nice weather he gave us from the very night that we asked him for it. And I trust that you will continue to believe for that for the rest of the camp meeting after I'm gone. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Would you stand with us? And if you need prayer, you come on down here and we'll pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word, for the tremendous things that you've shown us, Lord, for the jubilee trumpet that's about to blow, for that last trump, O oh God, that'll bring a change about us, that'll bring us behind the veil. Oh God, we thank you for all that you've showed to us. We pray, God, that this word will live in our hearts. And then in the coming days, O oh Lord, you'll bring forth fruit in your people from the truth that you've invested and planted in them. Hallelujah. Now let us go, Lord, by your Spirit and in your guidance with your hand upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Need every need of this camp, Lord. Every financial need, every physical need. Bless the ministry that remains here to minister to this people. That your, heavily, your anointing might be heavily upon them to feed and to bless and to minister to your people. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com or lhbconline.com There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.